So, hello guys. Um, today we are going to talk about Augustan literature. So, 18th century uh, British literature. And if you remember, some of you do because some of you were here last week, um, I did leave you on a cliffhanger about why Augustan literature is at all called Augustan literature. Uh, but I also told you that if you cannot sleep because of this, you can of course look it up. So now comes the time when I'm going to ask you, has anybody looked it up? Excellent! <laughs> Very good! I actually have at least one slide about this. So, <laughs> you know, if you had looked it up, I would not have uh, to this, explain this, but this way I actually have to. So that's good. So. This is actually both a very simple thing to answer and yet I'm going to talk a lot about it because it is simple but not that simple. So this has to do with the fact that the biggest poet and one of the biggest figures of the period, Alexander Pope, wrote an epistle, a literary letter in this case, a poetic letter, um, which, while it wasn't actually officially titled to Augustus, but it was mentioned straight under the title. So it was something addressed to Augustus. So the short answer is, the reason the Augustan period is called Augustan period because the biggest poet of the period wrote a text which became known, even if the official title was something else, as to Augustus and this gave the name uh, of the period. Now, yes, this is the short answer, but it doesn't explain anything really because you would be saying like, yeah, so what? Is this a completely random thing, like why does this matter that one guy wrote one poem which people started to call like this, why do we call a whole period like this? And the answer is that actually this is a bit more complex. First of all, um, Pope's poem was modeled on a Roman poem written by Horace, in Latin Horatius, uh, which was called Ad Augustum, which means to Augustus. And Horace's uh, poem was actually also, was, was really written to the emperor of the time, Augustus. And Horace's poem is really not just an epistle, but basically an ode. In Horace's poem, uh, Horace is really happy with the emperor and he's very satisfied with the way he rules Rome. He's very satisfied with how educated the emperor is and is also very uh, much praising Augustus as a writer. So basically, in the original version, um, this is really a celebratory poem of the emperor. Now you could say, okay, that's nice to know that Pope didn't just come up with this idea on his own, but then again, still, why do we call a whole period like this? And the answer is that actually, um, the British or the English king was George II, and while George II doesn't sound like Augustus, he actually his real name was George Augustus, or Georg Augustus actually, because he was German. Uh, so, if anybody in the 18th century wanted to criticize the king, then they usually pretended that they are criticizing the long dead Roman emperor of a long, long time ago. And this is not something that 
only Alexander Pope did, but this was actually uh, the case in newspapers, pamphlets, uh, essays, books, everybody who wanted to say that he's dissatisfied with the king just wrote formally something about the old Roman Empire emperor and they could get away with it. The reason for this, of course, is that it is not a good idea in the 18th century still to be directly and officially critical of the king because you can get into all kinds of trouble if you do that. But if you are not critical of him, but the old Roman emperor, then that's perfectly fine. Um, so, whereas the original poem of Horace's, as I said, was really, really saying how great an emperor um, Augustus is, this was not the case in Pope's poem. First of all, Pope did not like the Roman Emperor either. So for him, even the Roman Augustus was a bad ruler. But in his level of uh, valuation, okay, the Roman Emperor was bad, but the British King is even worse. So what he did is that he wrote um, a very satirical poem, which looks as if he was praising the king, but even uh, at first sight it is visible that this praise is rather criticism. Now, the reason this thus became such a, such a central figure, a central text that it could give its name to the whole period is twofold. First of all, as I said, most people were dissatisfied with the king, not only Pope, but they also usually considered him a weak and bad king. Somebody who is a disgrace to the throne of England because doesn't really speak much English at all. Uh, he wasn't just of German origin, he was born and raised in Germany. Uh, or not Germany at the time, but anyway, like one of the parts of what we now call Germany. Um, and he was mostly like this kind of nice decadent Baroque king who cared more about fun and celebration and uh, living the good life than anything else. So um, Pope's text absolutely um, resonated with the general opinion amongst intellectuals and um, Because we are talking about the Enlightenment, um, and as we mentioned, Enlightenment literature is very public, very political, very social, and very much satirical, they basically said, ha, it's such a good joke of popes to actually write a poem pretending that we are living in the era of the big Roman Emperor, so let's pretend it all. So they also, even already in the period, started to refer to themselves as Augustans, as those living in the great Augustan period of Britain. Um, so that's the reason. Because, um, if you recall what we mentioned in the previous lesson last week, um, Enlightenment literature, or Augustan literature, is literature, as I just said, which is social, political, public, critical, and often satirically critical, um, and one that deals with rational, logical descriptions rather than um, the uh, supernatural, like previous and later periods. So, um, the poem thus 
is a perfect example of the period that it is that it gives the name to. Now, so that we are already talking about Alexander Pope, why don't we continue talking about Alexander Pope? And there he is. Looks very nice. Handsome. Intellectual. Yes, but don't forget that portraits are not photographs. Because um, already in the middle, I'm mentioning that Pope suffered from um, spinal tuberculosis, which is the worst, one of the worst types of tuberculosis, because it means that this is not just your lung, but in fact your spine, it doesn't let you grow, it doesn't let you develop properly. It can actually, can and does spread to other parts. So in fact, he was a hunchback, even if not the Notre Dame. Um, he was very small. There are different accounts. We don't know exactly, but something between 138 to 148 centimeters, that is. So not even one and a half meter tall. Um, and he always had other problems because of his tuberculosis, so stomach aches, headaches, all the time, you know. He didn't have a very enjoyable and good life, is what I'm trying to say. And also to point out how nicely portraits can show only the good features and not the others. Because of course, he was a great poet. So let's show him as a great poet and let's keep the rest in silence. Um, by the way, he was extremely well educated, but almost completely uh, self-educated. Um, and I mention here the test acts. Do you remember what those are from your readings of the textbook? Or from what I said in the last few lessons, whenever we talked about Catholics? No? Nothing. Doesn't ring a bell? Okay, then I will put it in a different way. Do you remember um, Oliver Cromwell's Republic that actually did away with the king? They executed the king, um, Charles I. And then, when uh, Cromwell's son was executed in the same way, and they brought back Charles I's son, Charles II, they made him king, but there were conditions. Do you remember any of those conditions? Especially in terms of religion. Well, the condition was not only that he has to convert to the Church of England, but that no king of England can ever belong to any other church but the Church of England. So you have to be an Anglican to be a king or queen of England from the Restoration. There was nothing like that before. Now, obviously, this in itself wouldn't be a problem for Alexander Pope. He didn't want to be the king, nor could he be a king, because he wasn't of royal lineage. The problem is, uh, they didn't stop there. So yeah, that was a condition for the king, but then the parliament actually passed several other acts, that's why in the plural, which actually um, introduced similar limitations for the everyday people as well. Like the fact that you couldn't go to university if you were uh, not a member of the Church of England. So if you were Catholic or Puritan or whatever, no university for you. And we are not talking about free universities, we are talking about paid universities in the period, so money doesn't matter, you still cannot go to university. Um, but I say largely self-educated because that was really only true of the universities. 
By the way, another thing that Catholicism was a problem in is holding public offices. So working for the government in any uh, sense whatsoever. Another thing that was related to this is this. That is also because he was a Catholic. Um, they also banned Catholics from London and Westminster. They are now one city, but they used to be two. Um, to be more precise, 10 miles diameter from London and Westminster, the Catholics were not allowed to enter. At least in theory. Now, in practice, that's a different story, because obviously if you just went there and they didn't know who you were, how did they recognize you that you were a Catholic? But you obviously wouldn't be able to settle down, because once you settle down, you know, uh, that's a different story. So it did mean, however, that people like Alexander Pope had to live in a different city or in a village or somewhere not in the capital. Um, while you are saying this is crazy, why, why, why not in the capital, um, you might remember uh, Guy Fawkes and uh, the gunpowder plot. The Catholics were trying to blow up the parliament as it was, with all the uh, <laughs> representatives in them. So obviously they were a bit afraid of Catholics trying to do other terrorist attacks, we would call them these days. Uh, this was an unsuccessful terrorist attack, but it was an attempt. So maybe that's why. Anyway, so he had to live in the countryside and he couldn't go to college, but yet of course, he could go at least to, he had a secondary education, he could go that far. And he also worked very hard on self-education. So French, Italian, Latin and Greek were languages he was fluent in, to the, to the extent that he read Homer already at age six um, and not in translation. So not bad for somebody who had to do it on his own. Okay, now, he wrote mostly poetry. In fact, to the extent that even this, this book, an essay on criticism, which doesn't sound like poetry at all, it sounds like an essay, right? It's in the title. And it is an essay, but it is an essay written as a poem. So the, he wrote a whole essay on the role of the critic, what it means to be a literary critic, what kind of um, relationship there is between the writer and the critic, the writer and the text. So like a really serious work of literary theory, but he wrote the whole as poetry. Um, now, the fact that the Rape of the Lock and the Danciad are uh, poems are maybe less surprising. Now, this is a period of satire, right? I mentioned that most people and wrote at least a bit of parody or satire or anything like that. But many people wrote almost nothing else but satire. And in fact, Pope is definitely a good candidate for somebody who just couldn't turn off his ironical vein and just did it all the time. And um, this is why people didn't like him. So if he could have gone to London because of being a Catholic, he still probably wouldn't have done it very well because most people would hate him there anyway, because almost everybody was criticized by him once or twice or even more. Um, and actually, a good example of that is his work, The Danciad. And if you don't understand already at first sight what that might mean, then let me help. The Iad, of course, comes from Iliad. Um, but while Iliad is about the history of Troy, Ilium used to be another name for 
Troy. This, the stem here is dance, and dance is a verb still used in English. It is used for somebody who is dumb, dull, stupid, etc. So this is a mock epic of about stupid people. You know, like uh, praising their enormous stupidity, and especially actually of other writers, especially and, and poets and philosophers and thinkers and public figures. So, you know. Um, but these days, however funny the Danciad might be, we don't typically read the Danciad or teach the Danciad, but it's usually most often discussed of his works is the rape of the lock. Have you heard of it? Okay, now you do. So if you haven't heard of it, then probably you will need some help with the title. Because at first sight, you might say, what? What does this even mean, right? So, let's start with the word lock. Because that is not so obvious as it might look at the first sight. Because uh, we are not talking about the lock on the door, or we are not talking about the hanging lock either. We are talking about another meaning of lock, and a lock of hair is what we are talking about. Now, if you are saying, well, it didn't help at all, because maybe somebody wanting to rape a lock on the door sounds bad enough, but wanting to rape a lock of hair doesn't sound too good either. Uh, I help. This word also means something else than what you think. So yes, rape these days is of course used to refer to unwanted sexual encounter. But this use of the word rape is not so far away from the original. If you think about that, um, we could say that somebody who rapes somebody else is stealing or robbing that person of sexual consent. So basically, here the stealing part remains, just the sex is removed. So the raping of the lock is actually the stealing of a lock of hair. So the story is about somebody trying to cut a woman's hair, lock of hair, not all of it, just some a lock of her hair, and run away with it and, you know. Um, they were saying, okay, now there is nothing X-rated in this that's good, but this is still weird. And yes, it is. And this is exactly the point. Because, believe it or not, it's crazy, in the lifetime of Alexander Pope, one of the um, local gossips, <laughs> local gossips in um, in what would be the equivalent of a tabloid paper, uh, was that some nobleman actually cut the hair of some noblewoman without her agreeing, and her being very upset, and you know. So this was like what they discussed in public. Uh, it's not that different from uh, Blesk or <laughs> or whatever you read these days. So, yeah. And that was completely stupid. I mean, why would they actually debate in public? Well, there is one thing to it, and that is actually... Uh, like, if I really wanted to explain why this was even an issue... Well, I mean, there are several layers of why this could be an issue. And one thing is, imagine that somebody just goes there with some scissors and takes some of your hair away and then leaves. Like, you probably wouldn't be happy about it, right? Now, it might not get into Blesk. True. Unless it's a teacher. Then maybe. Uh, <laughs> but, um, it's still not nice. But there is something more to it. And that something more actually reaches back to the Renaissance and late Middle Ages, and that's the courtly ideal. Do you remember the courtly love with Petrarch? You know, the... Now, that thing, the courtly love, is not only about women 
whom you are in love with but who you cannot have, but also about people being in love with people who are not their wives or husband. So, because people were supposed to be in love with people they cannot have, uh, because they were not their wife or husband, um, what usually happened, if the feeling was mutual, then they would actually give each other tokens. Tokens meaning little items reminding the other person that that person loves him or her. So that they cannot actually have sex, but they can actually have a little ring or whatever and saying, yes, my heart is really yours. I don't care about my husband or wife or whatever. Um, and if it wasn't a ring or if it wasn't a brooch or if it wasn't, um, it very, very often was the lock of hair from the woman. Uh, it does have obviously some fetishistic value as well, but let's not go into that. So anyway, one typical thing was, so basically, if you would normally get a lock of hair as a gift expressing your love, if somebody just goes there with scissors and takes it, that's actually in a way, symbolically, really is rape, right? You didn't consent to giving the token to the other person. Um, but, if you are saying, yes, yes, but this is still ridiculously stupid, yes. This is exactly what Alexander Pope thought as well. He was like, come on, like, we cannot really seriously have this, that, like, public topic number one is who steals whose hair. Like, we can actually talk about more serious things than this. And this is why he wrote a whole book of epic epic poetry, uh, making fun of it. So he said, I are taking it seriously, then I will take it even more seriously. I will take it so seriously that it cannot be taken seriously anymore because it will be so ridiculous. So this is very similar in structure, content to the Iliad or the Odyssey or any other big epic poem. There are epic battles uh, and, uh, and intervention from God on both sides of the two fighters, you know, the man and the woman. Um, but it all takes place in dressing rooms and, and little uh, and bedrooms and, and, and in public and so on. So, you know, like these, these battles are not fought with guns and horses and so on, but in these everyday things like you know, scissors and combs and all these kind of things. So, fun, fun stuff to read. Also completely in poetry, but, well, that's Pope. He couldn't help it. Almost everything he wrote just ended up being poetry. Um, no, I'm joking, but really he wrote an amazing amount of poetry. So, do not imagine that these three books are his only poetry. He wrote lots and lots and lots of stuff, mostly in poetry and mostly in heroic couplets. So this is our little footnote of uh, knowledge about poetry. So if you remember, we already talked about the sonnet, which was very typical of the Renaissance, but survived and continued for up to this very day. Now, um, for the 18th century, and especially for Pope, but also for the others, uh, heroic couplets would be the typical form. Now, heroic couplets, in some ways, are not that different from the sonnet, in that the sonnets, if you remember, are written in iambic pentameters, so are heroic couplets. So heroic couplet is also based on iambic pentameters. And by the way, blank verse in which Shakespeare wrote, and not just Shakespeare, uh, the plays were also written in iambic pentameters, but without rhyme. So, state exam hint. If at any point in the state exam somebody asks you about any kind of English verse form, uh, 
and you say it's written in iambic pentameter, you might not be right, but you have a very high chance of being right, because blank verse is in iambic pentameter, uh, heroic uh, couplets are in iambic pentameter, and sonnets are also in iambic pentameter. So that's like a good, good guess in general in English poetry. Now, couplets, of course, you might understand that, because if you remember, in the English sonnet, the last two lines are called the couplet, and the reason they are called the couplet is because those are exactly two lines, and those two lines rhyme with each other. So heroic couplet simply means that the whole poem, so whole books even in, in these cases, uh, are written in a way that everything is in iambic pentameters and always the two lines after each other rhyme with each other. So the whole structure would be basically A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, or maybe A, A, B, B, A, A, you know, you could have like more, but like two, the two consecutive lines always rhyme with each other. And by the way, the reason they are called heroic, because very often they write heroic poems in them in English, so that's why. By the way, uh, while Pope liked to be sarcastic, he could turn it off sometimes because he actually translated the Iliad and partially the Odyssey, and those are serious, tragic, uh, serious heroic poems, and he seriously translated them without turning them into uh, farce or anything like that. Um, Iliad is completely his work. Uh, the Odyssey is interesting. He did it with co-authors, which in itself wouldn't be a problem. Yet, his contemporaries, when they found out that it was written by, uh, with, with, with the help of co-authors, they got really, really angry at him. And the reason for that was that he didn't write it on the book. So it got published as, you know, the Odyssey, translated by Alexander Pope, end of story. Which wasn't true. So they were actually, you know, angry because it was sort of like semi-plagiarized, sort of. Like, not really, because those people were paid for their work and they knew that they did it for him. So they were not plagiarized, they were actually what we would call ghostwriters. But the 18th century writers didn't appreciate uh, the biggest contemporary poet, who, by the way, criticizes them all the time for being stupid, actually writing one of his translations with ghostwriters. So, you know. But he was already able to afford such things. Okay. Now, um, the reason I talk so much about Pope is not only because um, he wrote so much poetry and was so influential, but also because there are not too many other poets in the period who are even worth mentioning. So uh, this period of literature was so much focused on public life, on, on social issues, uh, that actually the most typical and most natural form of writing was prose. So the absolute overwhelming majority of the period wrote especially prose. So although you shouldn't imagine that there were not a lot of poets in the period, there were, but there were not a lot of good poets in the period, but he was more than good. He is one of the, you know, he's entering our list of, which, which actually gets longer and longer every week, of the list of the biggest English poets of all time. You know? so, so he's also on the list. Um, okay, but I do want to mention one more poet at least. Although I'm cheating, there will be more than these two poets, but you will see that the other poets are not only poets. So I'm going to mention one more poet, uh, who is in many ways the exact opposite of Alexander Pope. And that guy was called Thomas Gray. And notice that Thomas Gray is actually much younger. See, so Pope actually was born still in the 17th century and lived 
quite long in the 17th century, but of course his texts mostly appeared already in the 18th. Whereas Thomas Gray is more late 18th century. So when I say in many ways he is the exact opposite, well, yeah. First of all, Paul wrote an extremely huge amount of things. This guy wrote very, very little. Uh, so in his lifetime, only 13 poems were published. And you could say, well, that's not little. Yes, that wouldn't be little, a little amount, if those were book length poems like popes. But no, we are talking about short poems, like sometimes a page. Um, so we are talking about publishing 13 short poems in his whole lifetime. And um, the reason for this is that he was extremely self-critical. He didn't think that he is good enough to publish or that he is um, he is okay, maybe publish, maybe sometimes, yes, but definitely not somebody who would be considered a great poet, um, or even a poet, really. For example, his best known work, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. In fact, if you ever hear about anything written by Thomas Gray, then it is probably this poem. He published this in his lifetime. But at first, not even under his own name. So he was so much uh, uncertain about his abilities as a writer that even when he decided to publish something, at first he was like, yeah, but uh, let's write some pseudonym, you know, in, in case somebody finds out that I wrote it. Okay, I have to mention, poet and scholar, scholar here is meant in the original sense, so he was actually teaching at a university. So maybe, you know, he was like, what if my students find out or something? I don't know. Um, anyway, however little he published, those poems became so loved by his contemporaries and so much instant hits that with just 13 published poems, he was actually offered the position of the poet laureate of the royal court, so the official poet of the king, which he didn't accept because, ah, come on, I'm not good enough for that. Come on. So, you know, uh, we have, he's not only an opposite of Pope in that he wrote little, but also is that Pope actually told that everybody was a bad poet basically, except for him. Uh, whereas this guy is like, everybody is a better poet than me, leave me alone. Um, and um, he was also an opposite because, whereas Pope was a typical Enlightenment poet focusing on uh, public issues, criticizing people, dealing with uh, what is good and what is bad, moral issues, this guy actually wrote about the beauties of the countryside, about feelings, like lyrical contemplative texts, and gothic themes. So even uh, things containing uh, the supernatural, which is absolutely not even typical for the Enlightenment. So in a way, we could consider him an early Romantic poet rather than an Enlightenment poet. Yes, we could, if we didn't ask the Romantic poets about this. Because the Romantic poets didn't like him at all. Although he did basically the same thing. Um, how do we know this? Well, very simple. Remember next week when we are going to talk about the Romantic period, we are going to talk about the fact that what started the British movement, romantic movement, was the publication of the lyrical ballads. Um, and in the second edition of the lyrical ballads, Wordsworth actually wrote a preface, an essay explaining what is there, 
how they see poetry, what they are trying to do. And in that preface, they are actually, he is extremely critical of this guy. So that's how we know that they wouldn't want him as an Enlightenment poet, I mean a Romantic poet, although he has more to do with the Romantic movement than with the Enlightenment. So anyway, uh, oh by the way, now you could say, yeah, okay, only 13 poets, poems were published, fine, but of course then he died, then there were literary scholars, who had nothing to do, and obviously they found all of his poetry, they published it, and now we actually can read thousands and thousands of Thomas Gray poems. No. Uh, yes, they did that, obviously they did, but the book is still very slim. So even everything, even things he didn't want to publish, collected together is not much. So he didn't write much, which might have to do with his self-critical attitude. You know, if you think things are not necessarily good enough, then you try to make them better, always better and better and better. So in fact, instead of writing more and more stuff, you are making those few things better and better. So that might be the reason. So these are two poets. So let's move to prose now, finally. And those who were here last week remember that Although officially it wasn't our topic, I did mention most of them already. But let's go through them again. And let's start with somebody I didn't mention last time. And that is actually probably the most famous writer of the period. So it's a good time to ask if you, if you have any guesses. So, 18th century British novel. Whom would you mention as probably the most famous one? And if you mention anybody from the 18th century, you will be rewarded for that with very good, even if it's not the one I'm thinking of. So, any? You might know him because he is mentioned even in like non-English literature classes. So even in high school, when you studied the history of the novel, you would probably be told that he was like the founder of the modern novel. It's not true, but that's what they teach. Don't be afraid. I won't steal your hair if you don't know it. Just say anything. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Okay. Yes, these are two very good names, and I was actually thinking of one of them. I was thinking of Swift. Yes. Good, <laughs> good. <laughs> Indeed, Swift is the one we are going to talk about. Um, Stevenson is a very, very good point, though. I mean, I'm really happy that you mentioned Stevenson, because he is rarely taken seriously. Because Stevenson had this bad luck that he didn't write serious literature, you know, but horror stories and and adventure stories, so, uh, but yeah, it would be a good point. No, but anyway, Swift is the one who is usually mentioned incorrectly as the one who made the novel. Incorrectly in the sense that, like, come on, where does the, the, the novel start, really? In the Renaissance, when we were discussing the Renaissance, we already discussed at least two novelists. Then, if you actually read the history of ancient Greek and Roman literature, you will find novelists there as well. So, you know, why, for some reason, here in Central Europe, we just think that the British invented the novel is a good question. Um, but anyway, they didn't. So, um, well, this guy was also very well educated just like Alexander Pope. The main difference is that unlike Alexander Pope, he could go to university. And as you see, he liked the fact that he could go to university because he went all the way. He did a BA, an MA, and a doctoral degree as well. DD is Doctor of Divinity. Um, so, by Doctor of Divinity, you probably also guessed correctly that he was somebody in the church, and 
of course, the Church of England, otherwise he couldn't have gone to university. Um, and you will be right, and this, uh, this is why, in the period he was often referred to in his later period of his life as Dean Swift, because he was, for some time, the Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. And time for our five-minute break. It didn't record the names of the girls. Oh, come on. How will I... So, um, basically, um, talking of, um, of Swift. Now, while he was, at least later in his life, a church person, as I mentioned, he was also involved in politics. So, in a way, he is not not atypical. So, if we say in this period, literature is usually political to some extent, he is a good example of that. Not only because he wrote literature, which was political, but at some point in his uh, life, he was actually a government advisor. Not for a long time, but still. Uh, that wasn't a good idea, really, in retrospect. He couldn't know that. But um, he was a member uh, of the Tory government. And um, as you probably read in the textbook, um, when this Tory government had um, secret talks with the French, to end the war. They were successful, actually, uh, because they were able to achieve peace and, you know, uh, but that didn't stop the Whig government after them to say, ah, you had secret talks with the enemy, you are traitors. So a lot of them were actually arrested, sentenced to prison sentences, etc., etc. Like, Swift didn't go to prison, but he had to leave London because, like, that's just somehow their thing. Like, if you're a Catholic, you have to leave London. If you're a traitor, you have to leave London. So, anyway, um, but not just London. In fact, he had to leave England as such. Uh, so, he spent most of his life in Ireland, which is not something which was very bad for him because he was Irish. He was. Ireland, so he just had to go home, uh, basically. Uh, in fact, he was so much Irish, even if we don't necessarily um, immediately think of him as Irish, because there is nothing too Irish about Gulliver's Travels, um, but he was so much Irish that one of his most often discussed texts, and we will also talk about it um, soon, in a few minutes, uh, a modest proposal is specifically focusing on uh, an Irish political issue of the time. But not only that. Actually, in 2017, there was a survey um, which actually tried to find out who is the best known Irish writer of all times, and guess who won? Um, so not Joyce, or not, you know, no, he. Um, by the way, that was not a survey that's actual factual statistics. Also, Gulliver's Travels is the, the Irish literary text that is available in the biggest amount of copies in the biggest amount of libraries in the world. So, the, in other words, the most easily available piece of Irish literary fiction is Gulliver's Travels. Um, now, he was an extremely prolific writer. He wrote 14 volumes of prose. His correspondence was published, which takes up three more volumes. And he wrote more than 900 pages of poetry. So much, 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 much more than Thomas Gray. 
uh, although we consider Thomas Gray a poet and we don't consider this guy a poet, uh, but just because he wrote so good prose. In fact, his poetry is not bad at all, and we will actually briefly mention some of his poetry. So this is whom I referred to at the beginning that, in fact, I will, I'm pretending there are only two, but really, there are at least two and a half. Um, so, best known works. Well, obviously, Gulliver's Travels and The Modest Proposal are the best known works. Um, Gulliver's Travels I'm not even going to talk about because everybody has heard about it, uh, seen million film versions which never actually cover the whole of it, but at least some of it. Um, you know, it's taught at school, so who cares? Um, let's talk instead of a tale of a tub, because it's rarely discussed, and um, it's also an interesting book. The tale of a tub, um, well, it's hard to say what it is about, because it's a long and complex satirical work, which actually branches off in all kinds of directions and has several separate plot lines and plot several topics. But if, if uh, there is a central story in it, then that central story is about uh, three sons, three boys born to the same father. And the father, when he is really um, old, actually gives each of the sons a coat. And that coat is great. That coat is very, very modern, beautiful, uh, good coat, so warm and keeps the rain out and all that, you know, perfect coat. But these three sons get these with one condition, and that is that they are not allowed to change the coats in any way. So that here it is, it's perfect, it's just for you, it's brand new, you can have it, because I'm old, I will die, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you cannot actually change it. Now, of course, guess what happens? They all will change it, but they will all try to do it in a way so that it would look like as if they didn't. So basically, like, because time passes, fashions change, the code becomes old-fashioned, you know. Um, so their thing is that they think about the exact words of what the father said. They didn't say, don't change it, but mention that like, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. So basically they actually, all three of them change it, but pretend that they didn't because they didn't specifically did it the specific way that the father told them not to. Um, which is good enough, but, I mean, funny enough, but actually this is, these are not just any kinds of sons. Their names are Peter, Jack, and Martin. Forget about Jack for a moment, that's probably the hardest to guess. Martin and Peter. Martin, like Martin Luther. Peter, like Saint Peter, who is supposedly the founder of the Catholic Church. And Jack then, of course, is, some, is of course Jean Calvin, the Calvinist guy. So these are the three big branches of modern, I mean, then modern uh, Christianity. And of course, the father then is none other than the Holy Father, God. And the coat is, of course, the word of God, the Bible. And basically, this is all about a criticism of all existing major Christian. Um, flavors, if you wish, uh, that they all basically pretend that they are the only ones who kept the original message of God, but they all changed it in one way or another, uh, just pretending that they didn't. And, but that's just 
that's just the, the, the most central story of this. Funny to remember that we are talking of the, the work of a cleric, a preacher, and of course, the Church of England of the three would fall somewhere in between um, Calvin and Luther, more Calvin than Luther, actually. So basically, it's self-criticism as well. I mean, not self, but like the self-church criticism. Um, okay. Um, modest proposal. I'm sure you've discussed it in the seminar. Can somebody tell me briefly what's the main outline of the text? About that, uh, children should be, should be sold, or babies should be sold to rich people as food. Mm -hmm. Good. What babies to what people? Like rich and poor, that's correct, but there is an important element missing. Nationalities. Irish babies to English rich men. That's a very important thing here. Basically, we are talking about what period is this? What is the main problem in Ireland? That they are poor and they have not much to eat. So that's why the solution we should sell our babies. They can eat them. We will have money and then we can also eat. Because, and this is going to be actually um, a problem in the history of Ireland whenever Ireland is under um, English rule, is that um, most of the land in Ireland would not be owned by the Irish. So, you know, in Ireland we also would have um, in the 18th and the 19th century is the Industrial Revolution, yes. But whereas in England, the land is fenced off by the English landlords and they would have their sheep there and they would then have their own factories there. In Ireland, it's a bit more complicated because the problem is that the land in Ireland is not owned by the Irish. It is actually owned by the English. So whereas... In England, they grow what they need. But in Ireland, they also grow what they need in England. And not in Ireland. So, um, for example, the Irish potato famine, the most famous example of this, would be that actually the Irish would be growing huge amounts of potato, and dying at the same time, because that potato was on the land of the English landlords, who would actually uh, export them out of, I mean, take them out of the Irish part and, um, and feed the English with them. So, when Swift is talking about, well, you know, why don't we just, he is discussing this issue. Why don't we just give them our babies so that they can eat it? Like, because basically, in a way, this is exactly what is happening. We have nothing to eat so that they can, not that they can eat, they have more than enough even without this, but that they can basically get fat, if you wish. So, um, interesting, you know, up to this point, you've heard a lot of examples of satire, being funny. This is satire too, but it's not funny at all. It is deadly serious satire. Um, by the way, satire still for a reason. You know, as I mentioned, he did some bad stuff, so he had to leave, but he wasn't put to prison. Like, if he actually wrote a text in which he would straight to your their face write that those bloody English men are doing this and this and this, that would be treason, incitement against um, the peace, etc., you know, open call for a civil war or whatever, he wouldn't get away with that. He would at least be arrested, maybe worse. Uh, this way, it's satire. I didn't say anything. I just wrote a modest proposal about, you know, 
<laughs> eating our babies, what's wrong with that? Um, a lot, but actually he can argue that this is not meant seriously. I cannot seriously mean that we should eat our babies, so this is obviously a joke, ha <laughs> ha. So this is nothing criminal. Um, very dark satire here. Um, okay, now, of his poetry, it's worth mentioning Cadenus and Vanessa, which is love poetry. Um, you should remember that Anglican priests can marry, uh, so it's not forbidden for an Anglican priest to write love poetry, I mean Anglican minister. Um, by the way, he didn't marry. He was never married, but he was in love several times. So, um, And the ladies' dressing room, which is actually a very uh, satirical <laughs> poem about an 18th century ladies' dressing room, describing in detail all the cosmetics and, and, and all the, um, the corsets and all of that thing. And basically, he has two points he's trying to make. A is that the beauty of our women is completely fake. You know, they have all those kinds of, you know, um, paint and powder and and we are talking 18th century cosmetics. So if you are thinking about, oh, this hasn't changed that much, it has changed a lot. Uh, the things that you can come in touch with, it's not going to kill you or, <laughs> or cause you skin cancer. And it's not actually of a color that, uh, on the thickness that your skin is invisible underneath. So, you know, he's obviously talking about a more serious problem. But anyway, you are also right if you said, well, that might still be a valid point, that, you know, like trying to use makeup to look different than you are is actually not necessarily the best way to look beautiful, sort of. Um, but anyway, careful, because he's not just criticizing the women, that he's, he's bigger than that. He's saying, yeah, there are the women who are doing all this trickery, this fake beauty, and then he also criticizes the man. Of course they are doing it. You are the ones forcing them to do that. You are so stupid that you are in love with something completely fake and ridiculous. So, um, good for them. By the way, a very similar point and a very similar scene is also in The Rape of the Lock. So actually this is something that uh, it seems was like pretty much a common thing to discuss in the period, or at least these two guys agreed on that. Um, okay, so let's get on because we will never finish as usual. So here is our other favorite, another one you've definitely heard of, Daniel Defoe, who is of course especially discussed in connection with Robinson Crusoe, and this is exactly the reason I'm also not really going to talk about Robinson Crusoe, because what's the point? You know it anyway. Uh, I will talk a bit more about the other things, and especially about the Journal of the Plague Year. Do you remember when the Great Plague was in Britain? 1665. Uh, so he was five years old at the time. Um, obviously, if you have the biggest epidemic of the century, uh, when you are five, however young you are, it's not going to just you know you're not going to forget about it. This is going to be like a big trauma. You know, you will see people dying all around, you know, people whom you may know, whom you may love, whatever. Uh, but of course, also, if you think about it, if you are just five, while well, you might have traumatic experiences and some vivid memories, you're obviously not going to remember everything in detail. You will remember less than you do. So, um, the book is, of course, um, not just based on his memories, and not even primarily based on his memories, but he actually did 
very, very extensive research about uh, what happened in the plague year. Uh, both research in terms of, you know, uh, reading newspapers from the period, um, going to, talking to, I mean, going to libraries, reading whatever was written about it. But not only that, he actually did also research of what could be considered um, oral history. So he actually talked to people who were already adult in the period who lived through and survived and asked them about it, including members of his extended family, but not only, like as many people as he could. So he did a lot of work into this. And yet, it is not, it is like, as you can see, I actually list it under novels. Now, this is a disputable fact because, like, it could be taken for a history book as well, but not really, not completely. Like, first of all, he actually wrote an actual diary about this of a non existent person, you know, because, like, he actually collected the story from the stories of dozens of people, from newspapers, etc. But he actually turned this into the diary of an imaginary character. So that's already a reason why this could be considered a novel. So it is actually on the borderline of fiction and non-fiction. Um, and this is actually true of the other two as well, by the way. I mean, it's not something we often talk about, but Robinson Crusoe had some uh, links to actual reality. It is partially based on the story of an actual shipwrecked person who lived for an extended amount of time on an island. Not for so long as in the novel. There was no Friday in his case, so obviously he added a lot of uh, romance and extra material. <laughs> um, but the difference between this and this is little, you know, in both cases he creates a character, in both cases he adds a lot of his own to what is actually documented fact. Same thing with Maul Flanders, which is a story of a prostitute. Um, so, yeah. Now, not just Locke, Locke, that's another period, Pope, but also Defoe was, of course, an extremely prolific writer, so he also wrote a lot, more than 500 books, um, of which are some are biographies, essays, some are history books, and some are novels. But as I mentioned, like in the case of uh, Defoe, the, the borderline between biography and novel, history and novel is thin, and it's actually a question of uh, it's a debatable thing where to put these. By the way, have you read Robinson Crusoe or any of these? Anybody? Yes? Good. Do you remember the format? Like a diary, yes. And this is actually not only true of Defoe, like yes, he mostly wrote diary form novels, but actually um, it is very frequent and very typical in the whole period. Um, so if you think of Gulliver's Travels, Gulliver's Travels is also actually said in the form of the um, diaries of Gulliver. And um, this is actually very usual for this period. Not all novels in the period, but many novels in the period are told in the form either, either of diaries or of letters sent between various characters in the story, you know, this, so either in letters or in diary entries. And in fact, uh, in terms of the genre, uh, novels told in the form of either a diary or uh, a collection of letters are often the, uh, collectively referred to as the epistolary novel. So novels based on letters, even if it's a diary, because a diary is basically also a collection of letters that you write to yourself and not, <laughs> not to somebody else. It still has dates and all the formal, you know. In fact, often, not, not, not everybody, not all the time, but you will even often have 
this form like dear diary or my dear diary. You actually have somebody whom you are sending that letter to. It's just not an actual living person. Um, but now this, this, that it is a diary or a collection of letters is actually also contributing to the fact that in some cases it is hard to decide whether something is fiction or non-fiction because the form itself, the structure itself, tries to look as if it was an actual letter, an actual diary, even if it's not. Have you read Gulliver's Travels? If you have, it starts with um, Swift presenting himself, first of all not as Swift, but as somebody else. So in fact, at first it wasn't published under his name. Um, so he, and even when it was published under his name, it's still already in the first page, he is calling himself something else. Um, so this person presents himself as the editor of this text, claiming that this text is actually he didn't do anything else, but just edited the diaries of this actually existing Gulliver after he returned. Uh, so, in this period, it's actually very typical that the novel would try to look as if it was a real story, even if it was completely made up. Now, in the case of Defoe, it is almost never completely made up. In the case of Swift, it is always completely made up, but still they both employ a structure and not just a structure but even an introduction in which they pretend that this is completely fact. So that's another, that's a funny thing, just you know, like that doesn't stay like that with the novels, mostly, there are a few exceptions, but the format is used later as well. In fact, if we have time, we certainly won't, but I will try. So, um, remind me when we reach Fielding that I want to make a reference to contemporary literature. Um, so, anyway, default, and let's now move to Richardson. Now, Samuel Richardson is in many ways quite different than uh, many of the previous characters, because everybody up to this point was relatively, not relatively, very objectively uh, very much well-educated. Maybe Defoe was the least well-educated of them. Um, but Richardson is a different story completely. He actually had very, very little formal education, just like uh, Pope, but for a different reason. And the reason is, in his case, is not that he would have been Catholic, he wasn't. It is that he was coming from a poor family, and his family didn't have money for much education. So the little education he did have were mostly in uh, various church-sponsored schools that were for free. In any case, uh, because of this, most of his education came uh, in the form of an apprenticeship to a printer. You know, in the old times, if you wanted to do some kind of profession which was not priest or uh, lawyer or medical doctor, um, then you would not go to a university but you would actually be an apprentice to somebody who was good at that job. So you would learn to make shoes as an apprentice, you would learn to make to print books as an apprentice, you would actually learn to be a potter or a hairdresser or anything like this. You would work for years and years, basically for free, at somebody else's office. Um, and then they decided that you were good enough uh, then they would tell you, okay, so now I officially give you a certificate that you're, you finished your apprenticeship, 
you can go and start your own office. They would then give you some money as well to do that. But the point is, um, it really completely depended on your master when they thought they didn't need you as free labor <laughs> anymore. I mean, they also taught you a lot of things. It really worked and they didn't necessarily all abuse this. But if they wanted to, they could, because there was no accreditation office or Ministry of Education to tell them apprenticeship lasts from exactly X amount of years and not more, and this is the curriculum. Nothing like that. So basically, you went there, you didn't pay, but you didn't get much either. You were allowed to work, and to look at the other working, and they were telling you how to do things. And you got a place to sleep and things to eat, so you got full board, but in many cases not really luxurious one. So anyway, this was what Richardson had to do, because that was the only thing uh, his family was able to afford in terms of like education beyond the basics of reading, writing, etc. Um, but in a print shop. And what is in a print shop? Obviously books, even more books and pamphlets and newspapers. So like in a way it wasn't difficult for him to educate himself because it was all around the place all the time. Um, but of course in his case that mostly meant A, English stuff uh, and B, um, the selection <laughs> depended on the kind of orders they got and not necessarily on um, any kind of principled selection of books. But uh, there is one more important thing to mention, not just that he basically was trained in a, amongst books, but also that from a very early age, he was very well known in the neighborhood, even when he was a child, that he had a great talent for storytelling, that he was really good at, you know, inventing stories and making up stories. And um, even as a child, so even before his apprenticeship, he would actually help older girls answer their love letters because he was already better read and more well read and the girls wanted to look like you know somebody like a lady they were like poor girls but still like a lady so um he would write the answers to the love letters for them like so obviously writing has been in a way of, in his blood even before he started being amongst books like in a print shop now he is best known for his epistolary novels, so even more epistolary novels, but in his case, these epistolary novels are epistolary in the closer sense, so they are not diaries, they are actually novels of letters. And I've already mentioned Pamela last time, right? And I mentioned that this is about the story of the servant girl who is very beautiful, and the master, the aristocratic uh, owner of a big palace, who thinks, ah, oh, this is a really beautiful girl, so it would be nice to, you know, have some sex and stuff. Um, and the girl doesn't think it's a good idea, because, and she's clever to think that, because we are in the 18th century. And in the 18th century, if you are a girl and you give birth to a baby and you are not married to the father of the baby, then you are out of luck. Because A, your, um, the person you work for can actually fire you because you are a woman of loose morals, even if he is a father. That, not a problem. Uh, that's not a fair world in this period. And B, you might not actually get a job anywhere else because you have a baby born out of wedlock. You're a horrible... Um, I almost said something. So anyway, um, you know, so Pamela is right. Let's not do that. Um, so she keeps refusing and refusing and refusing and refusing 
And um, the master keeps trying and trying and trying. And then eventually, of course, there is happy ending. Uh, the master realizes that in all those trying and all those years and all that, um, he actually spent enough time with her to actually really know her as a person. And that now he doesn't only want to have sex with her, but like really fell, fell in love with her. So it's high time to get married and have a happy ending. No, not completely. Like, yes, it does have a happy ending, but it's not a Disney story. So it doesn't end with the happy marriage and happily ever after. Um, Richardson is better than that. Because then the story continues that actually Pamela realizes that like, okay, okay, it's nice that we love each other, but I've always been a servant. Now I'm a lady. I'm, I don't know how it is done at all. I mean, how, how, how is it that like suddenly I have to give orders to the, to the servants who used to work with me and like, ah, so, I mean, you know, she has some trouble afterwards, but eventually everything will be sorted out. Uh, by the way, that guy, she marries, seriously weird. Because in his campaign of trying to have sex with her, he tries everything, including kidnapping her and locking her up somewhere else, which is like, oh, interesting. So, I mean, I'm not sure I would happily marry the guy, same guy, if she, he tells me, you know what, I actually love her, you, but okay. Um, so, in a way, um, of course, a lot of people, while this was actually an absolute bestseller of the time, it was really, really successful. At the same time, a lot of the other writers were making fun of Richardson. It's like, yeah, nice, nice, but like, isn't he a bit too naive and too innocent, you know, imagining that somebody who would kidnap somebody would then suddenly just realize that he was evil and, and he did a mistake and he truly loves her and this kind of stuff. So this is why Fielding wrote Shamela, which is a parody of Pamela. And that was actually the first major work with which Fielding became famous, writing a parody of Pamela, um, in which he is making fun of everything in that, in, that, in that novel, including the virtue of Pamela herself. In Fielding's version, Shamela is not this innocent, virginic, a uh, girl worried about her virtue, but is somebody actually reading uh, pornographic poetry by, and just pretending to be this in a, in a, impossible to approach person who is care, caring so much about her virginity and virtue, exactly with the intention to get the guy for herself. So in Fielding's version, she is hunting him and not the other way around. And she gets him, and when she gets him, she gets really bitchy with the servants on purpose, because this is what she wanted all the time, and the moment they marry, she no longer loves him, and these kind of things, you know. So, uh, it's the other way around. Um, yes, this is wonderful, uh, that there are two versions of this story, and they couldn't be more different. And by the way, Shamela is much shorter uh, than Pamela, and also completely possible to understand and follow without reading Pamela. So if you are thinking about reading something short and fun, then this is a good place to start. Uh, and you don't need to know the other one, really. Uh, not even to the extent that I told you. It, you could just read it as it is. Okay, now that's fine, but... Fielding also wrote the history of the adventures of Joseph Andrews and his friend, Mr. Abraham Ab Abrams, or simply Joseph Andrews. 18th century writers have a tendency to give long titles, and we have a tendency not to use those long titles and use a short version. So just, just Joseph Andrews. Now, Joseph Andrews 
is the brother of Pamela Andrews. So after writing a parody of the original story, he also wrote a non-parodic, at oftentimes, of course, funny and sarcastic because this is the 18th century, but still a serious uh, other story in the Pamela universe, Pamela's brother's story. Uh, we know that Pamela has a brother because, as I said, the original novel is uh, written in the form of letters, so those letters are always written to somebody. So we know exactly who are uh, the family members of Pamela even before this story. So he doesn't invent a new character, but anyway, he invents a whole book about that new character. So these days, we would absolutely call both of these fan fiction, but uh, this is good enough fan fiction to be famous on their own right. So if you wish Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey, really, you know, Fifty Shades is also fan fiction, but just nobody cares anymore. Although Fifty Shades is much worse than these two, but hey, <laughs> never mind, never mind. We are not here to judge literary works. And by the way, guess what? While I made a contemporary uh, um, reference, I wasn't thinking of this. So I wasn't thinking of Twilight and, and Fifty Shades. I was actually planning to mention uh, Di Bridget Jones's diary, which is the also epistolary novel, also written in the form of um, diary entries in many ways actually directly inspired by some of the 18th century classics. And do you remember the name of the uh, author? Helen Fielding. So, not related, but funny, funny coincidence. So let's move um, to those two remaining people we haven't discussed. And one of them is Lawrence Stern, who uh, is yet another fiction writer, because as you remember, the Augustan period being very much a publicly oriented period, a satirical period, a period where literary works like to comment on morals, and people's lives, and public business, of course, while it is possible to do that in poetry, it is easier to do that in prose. Um, so Stern, for a change, I have a photo of a statue and not a uh, painting. Now, <clears throat> I've already mentioned Stern to some extent, not last week, but the week before, when we were just talking about Augustan literature in general. And then I mentioned that um, he wrote probably the most unusual text of the period, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman, or simply Tristram Shandy, because that's yet another example of a book which has a long title, but we only use a short version of it. Uh, has anybody heard of Tristram Shandy or even read maybe Tristram Shandy? Well, you should, if you haven't. I mean, not should in the sense that it's going to be in the test. That's not going to be, but I mean, it's big fun. Actually, uh, what shows that it's a special book is probably that in the modernist period, the modernists considered Tristram Shandy as a pre-modernist text, something that is like what they try to write, uh, something that was um, hundreds of years before them doing something similar. And that's actually one thing. But then the postmodernists, who actually, of course, um, were satisfied with the radicalness of modernism, also consider Tristram Shandy as one of the pre-postmodern works of art. So if these two guys who don't necessarily love each other uh, that much, those two periods, both consider that work as their 
sort of early predecessor that's already something. Now, why is that? Well, uh, this text is in a lot of ways very similar to all of the other uh, Enlightenment texts that we discussed. We mentioned that those texts are often very uh, ironical, satirical, and also, if you remember when we were discussing, for example, uh, Tom Jones, I've actually mentioned how the text is metafictional, how it immediately and, and several times calls attention to the fact that it is a fictional text, that it doesn't really let you um, immerse yourself in the fiction, that it calls attention to the very makedness of the text, or madeness, rather. Uh, and this is true for this as well, but this one goes much, much further, including doing things like saying things like stories can come in different varieties. Some have simple plots, others have complex plots. And then, uh, actually having a page where there are various lines, straight, a little bit uh, curly, extremely curly, extremely chaotic, and then commenting on the fact that, see, this is how complex and can a plot line be. Or uh, describing the wallpaper of the uh, room, then there we would have an actual wallpaper as one page. Uh, to show you, rather than tell you, how uh, the wallpaper looked like, and many such things. So this book is really um, very self-conscious, very um, satirical about the very idea of writing, and this is what makes it uh, so loved by the modernists and the postmoderns who would actually uh, write metafictional works, commenting on the job of the author, commenting on the status of the work of art, etc., etc. So this already happens here. By the way, it's very funny too. So, you know, don't imagine this as a Finnegan's Wake story, you know, which is, okay, very meta, 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 but also very difficult to read, this, and very long. This is neither very long, nor very difficult to read. In fact, not at all difficult to read. So this is a story which comments on texts and literariness and the status of the work of art and the job of the author and the status of the author versus the work of art without actually being technical, difficult and full of um, indecipherable hypertextual links. So, good fun. Um, the sentimental journey through France and Italy is um, something in between a fictional text and a diary. Though in this case, not just formal. You know, I've mentioned that a lot of these novels uh, written in this period have the formal uh, structure of a diary. Robinson Crusoe is written as a diary. Um, um, Gliver's Travels is written as a diary, but those are nevertheless pretty much fictional texts, like actual novels just taking these format. Or the same thing goes for the letters in Pamela. Pamela didn't exist, the whole story is fictional, they just take letters. But this one actually is, com is, is Stern commenting on his own journey with um, a friend, but at the same time also inventing a lot of things which obviously not only didn't happen, but potentially also couldn't happen in real life. And this is also something that makes it very interesting about purely everyday things, about just getting from point A to point B, just describing the journey, and yet being able to do it in a way that the journey is actually interesting for a reader who has nothing to do with those two guys traveling. Um, 
But also, what adds an extra point of fun is that they never get to Italy. So although the title is from France to Italy, they just never reach it. Unfortunately, that is because Stern died. So I mean, that's not because he wanted it to be so extremely meta, but just life helps him make the story even more satirical in that he couldn't finish the journey and yet the title remained through France and Italy. And it just basically ends at some point. Okay, um, let's move on. Now, the last person is a bit of an odd one out. Because, okay, as you can see, he was a poet and a playwright as well, but he is usually not discussed because of that. In fact, almost never discussed as a writer. However, he is such an important cultural figure that it is just not really possible to talk about the period without mentioning him. Because he's not only influential and important for the period, but he actually has had an influence on uh, periods after him as well. For example, he wrote a dictionary of the English language, which is the first English-English dictionary in English. So one that is defining the terms. So earlier dictionaries existed, but they were bilingual dictionaries. So English-French, English-Latin, whatever. But no, this is the kind of dictionary that you are used to in the form of Oxford Advanced Learners or whatever, which is an encyclopedic dictionary. So a dictionary where he defines the meanings of the terms, gives examples, and actually even provides etymology in the cases where it is known or he thinks he knows the etymology. Sometimes his etymology is somewhat made up, but anyway. Um, it's a nice encyclopedic one uh, dictionary. Um, and in fact, it was so influential <laughs> that his dictionary was the the, the, the definitive dictionary of the English language until the Oxford English Dictionary, the OED. Have you heard of the OED? If you haven't, you should learn about it. The OED is, in terms of British English, the most important uh, dictionary. It's not the same as the Oxford Advanced Learners that you've probably seen. The OAD, the Oxford Advanced Learners is a short, um, user-friendly extra from the Oxford English Dictionary, which is several volumes and is really detailed. Now, Johnson's is not so detailed and not several volumes, but because he did it on his own. The Oxford English Dictionary is teamwork and several big name people worked on it in all kinds of periods. So for example, one of the contributors to the Oxford English Dictionary when it was first made was Tolkien. Uh, so, you know, big name people, I mean, like really serious linguists. Um, so, but Tolkien is 20th century. So the dictionary which was able to push Johnson's Dictionary of the Throne as the dictionary of English was made in the 20th century for the first time. So it actually, this dictionary was the definitive dictionary for hundreds of years, at least in Britain. It's a different story actually in the US because if you've heard of Webster's Dictionary, now Webster's Dictionary was written in the 19th century uh, and that sort of became, and still is to this day, the definitive American English dictionary. Uh, so that's a 19th century venture, 100, around 100 years after this one. Um, but that actually had a specific uh, mission. 
Webster wrote that American dictionary is specially with the purpose of uh, creating an American dictionary. So not just to create a dictionary, but um, make systematic changes to the English language in terms of spelling, for example, in terms of adding uh, adding words that are not used and known in Britain of the time, but are used every day in America. So that sort of comes in between this one and the Oxford English Dictionary, but of course, that's specific. That's like a nation-forming political project as well, not only a, a literary project. Okay, now, another interesting work, Lives of the Most Eminent English Poets. It's actually, an it has an interesting story to this. This didn't start out as a book at all. Um, Johnson was actually had an agreement with a publisher that they would publish uh, all the great works of English literature that exist um, and Johnson would write an introductory essay to all of those books. This is standard practice these days as well. If you get, for example, a Penguin edition of whatever, you usually have like a 10-15 page introductory essay, which partially is an introductory essay to the author and the author's life, but partially about the work which is in the book, which is exactly the case with this as well. So the title is a bit misleading. So they actually started publishing that, and they published it, they published, if I'm not mistaken, 55 volumes. So, quite a big series of the greatest works. But, people liked his introductions in the period. They said it, these are good and like, you know, it's, it's a bit problematic to use them because you have to either buy all the 55 books or you have to always go to a library or you know it's difficult so please 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 publisher and please 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 uh, Johnson wouldn't you want to actually make a compilation of just the essays it would be nice and that's how this happened um, the plays of William Shakespeare um, Johnson tried to do his best to look at various versions of Shakespeare's plays as published and find through philological research oriented methods to find out which version is the earliest, the most definitive, the most original, then publish that and then write again introductory essays to those. Now, contemporary scholarship obviously doesn't necessarily use the texts of Shakespeare's plays in this, because since then we have discovered even more definitive versions. Um, in fact, some of the, the, the editions are even a compilation of two or three versions, because it doesn't work so simple as which the, the earliest is the best. Because, if you remember when we discussed the history of uh, English theatre, uh, in the period of Renaissance theatre, then we discussed that they worked in a way that they would um, make changes to the play every day based on the reaction of the audience. So, just because a version of the play is earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's better, it might even mean that it's worse, actually. Um, not to mention that those various editions were published in various ways and those who compiled them might have their own agenda. So it's not as simple as 18th century literary scholarship would have it, is that the first one is the best. So we are no longer necessarily using the texts that he has there, but what is still quoted and used are his actual essays in those as well. So that's a whole series of books. Uh, so this is 
This is why we are talking about him. He is somebody who's made an impact on linguistics with the dictionary and literary scholarship that is that can be felt even these days, which is rare in terms of literary and linguistic scholarship. Um, by the way, everybody referred to him in the period and also for a long time after that as Dr. Johnson, although unlike many of the other people we discussed, he didn't actually have uh, not only a doctorate, but even any university title. He didn't finish his studies. 